for my family, for my sons, for my parents who gave me my values and my principles, for the people of Sao Paulo, for the people of my native land, for all Brazilians, I vote yes to impeachment. With the help of God, for my family, for the Brazilian people, for the evangelicals of the whole nation, for the young people of the Free Brazil movement who took to the streets to say it, it was time to do the housework, time to say ciao to that darling and ciao to the Workers' Party, that party of darkness, I vote yes to impeachment, Mr. President. For my country, for God, for my family who are good people, my vote is yes, out with Gilma, out with Lula, out with the PT. The evening of April 17th, 2016. Every Brazilian has his eyes glued to his screen, following the vote that will seal the fate of President Dilma Rousseff and trigger her impeachment. In Parliament, it's a riot. I must repeat, Dilma, you are shameful! 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 Yes! The next day proved a difficult awakening for Brazilians. The removal of President Dilma was voted in by a crushing majority of MPs. In a clamor of hatefulness, they drove her out of office. Only a year and a half after her election, and in spite of the 54 million voters who had demonstrated their confidence in her for a second term. Some rejoiced over it, Others decried it as a coup d'etat, but all over the country, people felt a sense of unease. The MPs meant to be representing them and embodying the future of Brazil had voted on behalf of their families, their sons, their wives, former torturers or of their god, but not on behalf of the people or of the country. For the first time, the people saw the real faces of their elected representatives. When you see that to be elected an MP in Brazil, you need a minimum of 2 million euros because campaigning is very expensive. Not only do they need an enormous amount of money to be elected, but they are the face of money. Unlike the Brazilian population, Brazilian money is white, masculine, heterosexual, old. That's the face money has. They have the face of this Brazilian money. In a country where as much as 10% of the people claim to be businessmen, 80% of them are in the Congress. It's a Congress of businessmen. They are there to represent business. How can you wake up in a country, your own country, when the person chosen by the people has been removed? Why are the streets so empty? And if you wanted to cry out, make your voice heard, how could you do it? How can you resist when there are neither tanks nor soldiers? Like all those of his generation, Gregorio grew up in a democracy. He doesn't know how to cry out very well either, but he's not an ordinary citizen. Humorist and writer, his scathing videos sometimes have up to 20 million hits on the internet, and they make the whole of Brazil laugh. He's listened to. He's allowed to ask questions, even to the president, who will soon be leaving her palace. In 1964, when she was his age, she managed to resist a coup d'etat complete with tanks and torturers. Hello. 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 How are you? Hello. I'm very pleased to meet you. The pleasure is mine. So pleased. Thank you very much. What would she do today? This coup d'etat is special. It seems more obscure, more untruthful, more underhand, more convoluted than a military coup d'etat, which is more visible. 
No, it's not violent. I mean, from a certain viewpoint, it's not violent. I'll explain to you in what way it's not violent. It doesn't take away directly. It will always try to diminish your rights. But it cannot, because of its singularities, do away with freedom of speech, freedom to demonstrate. It cannot order the police to incarcerate you. It cannot do that. So, I think your resistance is fundamental. Why? Because your resistance strengthens institutions. I'll give you a more concrete example. Let us say that democracy is a tree. Let us say that. A military coup d'état is like an axe that's going to chop the tree down, and then it's going to bring down the government, and then the whole regime. This coup d'état, if democracy is a tree, it's like the tree is attacked by parasites, by fungus, that spreads into all the institutions. What kind of battle can we wage against them? The answer is this. We must widen the democratic space, discussion, debate, explanation of positions. The best fight against the parasites is the oxygen of democracy, the oxygen of criticism, of debate, of positions, difference, of saying what you think. That is the best instrument. It's a pretty parable. But it doesn't take into account a reality that's poisoning the country. Corruption, revealed in a huge scandal known as Lava Jato. A small provincial judge investigating a car wash business for a mundane case of money laundering triggered a shockwave across the whole country. Judge Moro uncovered one of the biggest corruption cases in the world involving the giant Petrobras. This public petroleum group had been robbed of more than 3 billion euros to finance all Brazil's political parties, among them Gilma's PT. Moro and the other judges of his conscription did not waver. There are today in Brazil company directors and politicians in prison, something that had never happened in the country. The president herself, even if she was not personally implicated, did not survive the scandal. But Brazil's chaotic political system is still in place. To understand this system of corruption, you have to understand how the Brazilian political system works. It's a presidential coalition. In order for the president to be able to form a coalition, a practice had been established in which political parties determined the individuals to be appointed as director of Petrobras or to other important public posts like minister of state, for example. If the president gives his assent, the parties in exchange give their political support. But what we've seen is that these appointments as director of Petrobras or as minister of state were made so that those appointed could receive bribes for their own political parties. Since the Workers' Party, the PT, had been in power since 2002, it was natural that evidence come to light against people linked to the PT or to parties supporting the PT. Criticism, debate, opinions are the oxygen of democracy, says Gilma Rousseff. Gregorio has a few extra tools, derision, humor, and an audience. With a handful of friends, he created a site on the internet called Porta dos Fundos, which means tradesman's entrance, and which has up to two million subscribers. He makes Brazil laugh at least twice a week, sending up the powerful and the foolish. Among them, the venal politicians ready to betray all their friends for cuts in sentences, or policemen more determined to hit the left than the right. Marcharam, pode emitir o mandato de prisão. 
avisa lá pro juiz que a gente pegou o Lula. The video denunciation caused violent reactions because we were making fun of the federal police who were in charge of investigations. And we were making fun of their partiality as they arrest many more people from the left. And when I say left, that's the Workers' Party, the PT. That's not really so far left anymore. They seem more concerned with corruption within the PT than they are with corruption within the right-wing PSDB. And that's shocking because the police force in Brazil is a sacred institution. What's sacred for the left is Lula, the former president. For months, the judges have been after him. To bring him down, no holds barred. Sometimes, tactics were only just legal, like tapping phone conversations with his lawyers. Or like this highly mediatized arrest, which took place a month before the impeachment of a successor was put in place. 200 police officers mobilized, 44 warrants issued by judges, who were well aware that this little presentation, broadcast by the media, would definitely put an end to the workers' hero. To no avail, he was released three hours later. Moro didn't need to send all the forces of the federal police to my place in the early morning, to my son's house. He didn't need to. He could have simply summoned us. We were Democrats before him. Before them, we used to do things correctly in this country. Because while they were doing nothing, we were already fighting for the nation's right to freedom of free speech, the right to a free press, the right to create political parties, to strike. So all they needed to do was summon us. Regrettably, they preferred to use force, arrogance, a show, a fireworks display. And the show went on. When the judge called the press, it came running. Today, the Minister of Justice accused Mr. Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva of being the supreme commander of the Lava Jato corruption affair. Can you go backwards? Backwards? No, backwards. No, that's forwards. For him it's very clear, for others much less so, and especially without proof. The judges have admit this. We are now going to present you with a conjunction of evidence and context which leads us to conclude, beyond all reasonable doubt, that Lula was the supreme commander-in-chief of the corruption network uncovered in the Lava Jato affair. Social networks had a ball poking fun at this magistrate who had convictions but no proof. Worse, a good many lawyers were indignant about an accusation based on illegal phone tappings. I was already a lawyer in the days of the military dictatorship. In military courts, lawyers were respected, listened to. But today, lawyers are having their phones tapped. The lawyer talks to his client, discusses things with his client. The police record and divulge. They divulge the conversation. They give it to the press. They divulge conversations of a lawyer with his client. It's a violation of the right to defense, an unacceptable violation carried out by true fundamentalists. They're like religious fanatics. It's horrible. What is certain is that judges have learned to rely on public opinion to keep their investigations alive. The great tumult that resulted from the impeachment of the president set them free from the pressures of all the powers that were once part of their daily lives. Their conduit to public opinion is the press, of course, a press that is all the more useful as it refuses to accept that judges can be biased as long as they come down on the workers' party. The new president, Michel Temer, could also be caught up in affairs like Lava Jato, but the press, none of the press, would ever talk about that. Brazil is very close to being a media dictatorship, a dictatorship that is controlled by half a dozen families. We're very close to that. I've had a long career in journalism. 
but have never seen anything like what's happening now. A press that is hyper-concentrated in the hands of six big families, with notably one superpower group, Globo, that controls the television, radio, and the newspapers read by the majority of Brazilians. La Globo clearly has a position which is to bring down the president through impeachment, to put Lula behind bars. In any case, to make sure that he's not in a position to run for election in 2018. For example, when Lula was arrested and taken by force by the federal police, La Globo brought out a special edition that was more important in terms of time. It was a long edition. When Judge Morrow leaked phone taps of Gilma and Lula and other taps of Lula, La Globo also did a special edition. On the other hand, when a list was leaked of politicians who had received bribes from a BTP company, Odebrecht, La Globo said they would not give the names because they didn't have time on the channel. Gregorio, nevertheless, found a newspaper that gave him carte blanche. He wrote a weekly column for Folio de Sao Paulo, the only daily in Brazil with liberal tendencies. Here, at least, they accepted discussion. There really was this criticism. The defenders of the PT of ex-president Gilma seriously criticized the main press for having helped and contributed in what they call a coup d'etat. La Folha has taken the position against impeachment. It claimed that there was no reason for such a dismissal. On the other hand, what La Folha rejects is the word coup d'etat because constitutional rules had been upheld. Excuse me, Fabio. I find it interesting that you say there was no reason for impeachment, because if there is no reason to remove the president, then it's a coup d'etat, isn't it, if there were no reason? Not necessarily. A coup d'etat doesn't respect the Constitution. But in this case, constitutional rules were followed. It was a Kafka-esque trial. Kafka's trial was perfect as well. Legally, everything was done according to the law. Everything was fine, but in fact, the guy hadn't done anything. The press found the procedure well-founded. It greeted the new president that came out of the whole thing, Michel Temer, a man who had blithely betrayed Gilma, whose vice president he had been. Today, he can happily invite all his parliamentary friends to the presidential palace, those same people who had foamed with hatred when it came time to voting for impeachment. Stunned, Brazilians kept quiet, but they were mulling it over. The walls proclaim the spirit of the people, Fura Temer, clear out Temer. The popularity rating of the new president is today close to zero. It might even drop below if he's caught out in corruption scandals, as have been two-thirds of the MPs. Temer has no popular legitimacy. He is simply the showcase of a disparate parliamentary majority, fiercely attached to its own interests. Like the MPs of the Rural Front, who show no shame displaying their power. Agriculture is the basis of the country, and if you don't have a minister who speaks the same language as our rural front, it won't last long. Neither the minister nor the president. There are over 200 of us parliamentarians who make up the Rural Front in Congress. We defend Brazilian culture, which is today the heart and lungs of the Brazilian economy. We have the largest producer of soya in the world, Bairro Maggi. 
We have with us the largest orange juice producer in the world. He's part of our group. We have here the three largest stock breeders in the world. They are with us as well. As are the four largest cotton producers of the world, and there are also the largest exporters of Brazilian agricultural products. Nothing but blue bloods, next to whom Deputy Carlos Heinz looks almost like a peasant. I have about 1,600 hectares. You see, when they're called, they come. The deputy is a model of success, Brazilian style. It was during the military regimes that agriculture developed as it did. Brazil harvests more than 200 million tons of cereals. It has today 200 million head of livestock, because all that started back then. He was happy enough when the military divided up the land between deserving farmers like himself. But when the PT came to power and began dividing lands between the landless and the Indians, he became a lot less friendly. Our good deputy realized that he didn't like all forms of sharing. My anger towards them, what we've been fighting against for a long time, is that they take the land and they don't produce. A good many of these families don't have houses to live in, they don't have water, electricity, they have no technical assistance, and few of them actually produce anything. And still they want more land, more land, more land. It's a mistake. You know how much land the Indians in Brazil have? 113 million hectares just for the Indians, and today they want another 40, 50 million hectares. They want to steal the land from the producers. That was the project of President Lula and of President Gilmer. It was nonsense. Ah, this is our riches. <laughs> yes, it's the family. Heinze holds open house every Sunday with his family and other big property owners in the area. In 2014, he obtained the Racist of the Year Prize, awarded by the English NGO Survival, for having said, there's a man in the presidency, a minister of President Gilmar's named Gilberto Cavallo, who's filling his cabinet with Indians, with blacks, the landless, gays, lesbians. The family doesn't exist in this gentleman's cabinet. That is President Gilmar's government. Don't expect these people to solve our problems. The landless, blacks, or the lesbians who are incapable of doing anything, there are some not very far from his home. More than 20 years ago, around 1,500 families took over a couple hundred acres of land at Nova Santa Rita and created a totally organic agricultural cooperative. It is today a little Florida and a company that supports peasants who were formerly landless. When you fight for land, you're considered one of the marginalized, a thief. It's sort of like that. If we hadn't fought for the land, I might have remained in the area, but I would have looked for work elsewhere or in town. What is clear is that many people have lost their jobs due to mechanization, and there is a high usage of pesticides, of agrotoxins, because Brazil is one of the largest consumers of pesticides in agriculture, and we're against that here.
They did well. In Brazil, the consumption of organic products is growing, and the state supports this trend by regularly buying meat and rice from the cooperative. But today, nothing is safe. The feeling we get from Tomeo's government is of stepping backward in a very short space of time. I went to the Bank of Brazil last week. We'd been receiving funds from PRONAF for agro-industry. The director said to me, no, this is now reserved for those with a turnover above 10 million euros. Before it was for us too, now it's been cut, it's just for the big guys. In the poorest regions of Brazil, like Sertão in the north of the country, decisions being taken by the new government are already being felt. This is where Lula and Dilma had undertaken the largest number of support programs for small farmers. Training programs, buying productions, or programs as concrete as the aid for the construction of water tanks, vital in these dry areas. Eliomar will undoubtedly be one of the last to benefit from these. That's going to change a lot for us because, my God, there's no water here. It rains once a week, but this tank is going to change the lives of a lot of people here. Very soon, Alavio, the builder, will have no more work. Austerity and the economic crisis were already threatening his work, but he knows that the worst is yet to come. The coordinators for the water tank program called us to a meeting and they said, those who can find another job, do it. You should go, because they're going to get rid of this project definitively. As well as taking away jobs, we're going to suffer more from drought. They can't get rid of a social program that brings water. Our lives depend on it. Really, both people and animals. The main media don't talk about this either. The alternative media, yes, they do. And they're developing quickly. Gregorio obviously supports them. There's a meeting today at Publica Agency in Rio. It's a site created by two women which promotes scathing surveys and open debates. You have sensational articles. It's explosive. One in particular really fascinates me. Publica has listed the right-wing sites to try to understand why the Internet has suddenly been swallowed up by the right and how this happened. It's an extraordinary work of investigation that the newspapers don't have the courage to do. Agência Pública emerged out of a very interesting time. I was a partner in WikiLeaks during the leak of documents from American embassies, important leaks, when Julian Assange was imprisoned. Here, these documents were underexploited. And that was a great shock to me. Publica got to work and won all the Latin American prizes for journalism in 2016. The new generation of journalists is there, and the new powers that be won't be able to continue covering up their dark secrets with smooth talk. You cannot spend more than you have. It's like with your home. If one month you spend more than you earn, the next month you'll have to make savings to balance the accounts on your home. That's why it is imperative to vote on a ceiling for public spending. It's a question of respect for the government. I think that in only a few months, Temer has already destroyed a lot. I'm very frightened that there'll be nothing left, that Brazil will become shorn earth. In the 60s, with João Goulart, there was a wonderful program for agrarian reform, much better than what we have today. That was 50 years ago. Then there was a military coup d'etat that was totally against this kind of agrarian reform, and this project was lost. 
Brazil has always lost the chance to do great things. But there's a difference with 64, and that's that today we have a strong capacity for mobilization with the Internet. But not only that, we have the people, I wouldn't call them totally enlightened because education is still poor, but a more enlightened people and a very angry youth. The new government is not very concerned about it. It amended the constitution to impose an absolute freeze on public spending for the next 20 years. And it has barely touched the staggering central bank interest rate, still close to 13 percent, a hefty reward for the hedge funds that finance the country's enormous debt. The deal, the pact that ties the financial banking and ludism circles together is, you make the juicy profits, but we redistribute. That was the way of it. Banks could practice high interest rates, and that supported the funds of Brazil's government. Today, it's no longer a matter of taking on banks and financial institutions, as Jilma Rousseff did in 2012, when she wanted to adjust rates and profits. The reaction from the banking sector was virulent. At that time, they saw Jilma Rousseff as an opponent. It was an important point, not as a direct changeover. You can't say it equals destitution, but it equals the alarm bell that shows the turnabout in alliances within the Brazilian powers, where the banking and financial sectors consider the pettist government as one to eliminate, one that no longer corresponds to its interests. In 2012, neighboring Paraguay also experienced a misfortune Brazilian style. The progressive president Fernando Lujo, artisan of great agrarian reform, opposed to the OMG lobby and slightly to the left, was dismissed within 24 hours following violent clashes between peasants and police. An ideal pretext set up by a partisan press and often corrupt deputies. Lujo, not sensitive to the sirens of finance, did not have the means to resist, and those who had overthrown him rewarded themselves immediately. From the very first week, there was an executive degree allowing multinationals to import genetically modified seeds, something we've been putting the brakes on. That was the first thing. And then they declared national interest. The investments of Rio Tinto Alcan, a large multinational that was mobilizing more or less a quarter of our electrical production, from the Itaipu Dam for its own industrial project. Those were the two most significant facts. At the time, the whole world protested against this coup d'etat. The one Gilma Rousseff complained of hadn't been of much concern. It must be said that left-wing leaders in Latin America are a dying breed, condemned to wander from one Congress to another, far removed from business. Why did they remove me from office? What was my sin? What did I do wrong? Of course, I did some bad things, plenty of them. But what people told me was that I hadn't been dismissed for the things I'd done badly, but for the things I'd done well. It has been said that Latin America is going through a sort of reversal of institutional democracy, a reversal expressed in parliamentary coup in some cases. The latest of these was committed against Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff. Brazil, Paraguay, less blood than in the last century, but the result is the same. When a legitimate power disturbs, it can be overthrown. This reversal is also reflected in a new diplomatic situation. Lula and his successor chose to distance themselves from the United States and Europe, notably to develop relations with the emerging countries, BRICS, a mission which obviously does not enthrall José Serra, the new Minister for Foreign Affairs. The BRICS are a group of important countries, Argentina, uh, no, sorry, Brazil, India, China, South Africa, Russia, and Russia. B for Brazil, 
A for Russia. I for India. C for China. And S for South Africa. South Africa. It's revealing. Brazil's policy in South America is no longer a proactive policy, aiming at a consensual hegemony like it had been for Lula, wherein Brazil would be sort of the Germany of the region. That's no longer the idea. The idea now is to establish a place for Brazil in international markets and within the framework of the United States and Europe. Today, with Temer, the watchwords are normalization and realignment. It's really this idea that Brazil will try to take advantage of its situation of vassalization in relation to Washington. The United States did not condemn the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, claiming that it had confidence in the Brazilian democratic institutions. In fact, appearances were saved. As planned, Brazilian municipal elections went ahead. Yesteryear's ticks were coming back, flags, bumper stickers. But the old confidence had gone out of it. All the traditional parties were tainted by corruption. Not a day went by without someone arrested, tried or caught. Not a day without a demonstration against the new government. In whom to place one's hope? Who to vote for? And for what project? In Rio, in the streets, the most vigorous militants were those of the PSOL, a little party to the left of the PT. Marcelo Fischo, one of its leaders, had been fighting for years against corruption and violence. He was candidate for the city council of Rio, held by the party that had precipitated the president's fall. Dismantling the centrists of the PMDB means guaranteeing more democracy in the city, more participation to make sure that education, health and housing are priorities for those who need it. Everything that's important for Gregorio Duvivier, so he gives him his support. He represents a new left, contrary to the rail politique of the PT, that only makes policies through alliances. The PSOL is a small party with little television time, not much money, and I think that's what makes it interesting. He's a candidate with a dream, maybe not of utopia, but in the belief in utopia, because utopias are possible. Faced with utopia, there are formidable opponents. A priori people of peace, like the faithful of this evangelical church run by billionaire pastor Silas Malafaya. He is one of the most fervent supporters of another pastor, Marcella Crivella, who is running for mayor. Malafaya threw his fortune, his flock, and his fundamentalism into the battle. In a confused Brazil, his provocative sermons bring forth conversions and, moreover, gifts. Play the film, my son, please. It's not pink. No, there's no pink in this church. Uh, is there any pink here? Does the gay movement work here? Cut, cut, my son, cut. I'm in favor of Crivella, because on the other side, with all due respect, what is the PSOL? Who is Freixo? Everything I fought against my whole life. This guy is in favor of black blocs, the boys wreck the city. He's for the liberalization of drugs, for the professionalization of prostitution, for the ideology of the genre, which in this country is shameful. They want to teach eroticized children in school, which is forbidden by the Constitution, so this fellow is for everything we're against. May God deliver us from a man like this. 
is the worst type of left that exists. He's a Marxist. Marcello Crivella, the hard and fast evangelical, surfing the wave of the all rotten who is submerging Brazil, won the position of mayor of Rio with 60% of the vote. Crivella is mayor! For the left, and especially the Workers' Party, it was a disaster. With a fallen president, and ministers and elected officials still entangled in the Lava Jato scandal, and a founding father, Lula, still in the sightlights of a stubborn judge, the PT lost 60% of its town councils, its worst setback in 20 years. And another sign of disaffection, abstention, theoretically illegal, had been extensive. And it wasn't the economy that would put Brazilians back in a good mood. Itaborai, across from Rio de Janeiro, was to become an oil metropolis. But crude prices collapsed, and corruption-related scandals led Petrobras to close the huge petrochemical complex that was brand new. From one day to the next, 30,000 workers found themselves unemployed. Shops shut, Itaborai turned into a ghost town, and its disillusioned inhabitants were often reduced to municipally funded meals for 60 centimes. And so as everywhere, the new poor of Itaborai turned towards evangelism, like this young father of a family who'd come from Bahia, and today finds himself unemployed without enough money to buy himself a bus ticket home. You have to believe, don't you? That way, things can change. I used to vote for the PT because I thought like this. PT means Workers' Party, so in favor of the workers. But there came a time when I thought the PT had lost its way. I think it lost its way in its convictions. Now, I vote according to the candidate who's running. I look first at the candidate, independently of the party. There is no longer any hope in parties. The evangelicals have replaced them with faith. And what's more, they distribute food parcels. The best way to fight the parasites in the tree of democracy, said the fallen president to Gregorio, is with the oxygen of debate and difference. There are voices in Brazil today that are in tune with these words. Voices that are rising to reconnect with the rights of the people so that they may reappropriate public affairs by imposing the right to housing, for example. At 59, Janet moved to this encampment, Nova Palestina, on the outskirts of Sao Paulo. This is my kitchen. Those are my burners. And this is my toilet that I pieced together myself. But that's what I've got. And this is my bedroom with my bed. I leave the plastic on it so it doesn't get dusty. Janet is a maid. She spends more than three hours on the bus every morning to get to work, and the same in the evening to come home. As she doesn't work full-time anymore, she couldn't pay her rent. The lady I do little jobs for told me that people had taken over this land. I came here on the run. I took a sack and a knife. I was frightened, girl, very frightened. But I had no choice, and that took the fear away. 
She's a little upset that things are so bad for Lula, her hero. Lula helped a lot of fathers and mothers of families out of misery. And today, look at the reward he gets. The PSDB, those right-wing men, they're a party for the rich. They don't like the poor. The poor for them are good only to wash the floors when they're not being used as carpets to step on. Janet found another buttress in her little life, the Movement for Workers Without Roofs. It has been active for 15 years under the leadership of Guillem Boulos, a man who managed to impose a balance of power on local authorities so that social housing plans were neither diverted nor distorted. Here, in Jao Candido, three years ago, it was an occupied zone, like Janet's. The state ended up building social housing. Thanks to the movement, the inhabitants imposed their norms, and the promoters had to comply. You see, Gregorio, two years after handing over the keys, it's still in very good condition. There has not been a single case of vandalism. And why? Because it's not like these people were pulled out of one place and thrown in here like good-for-nothings. Here, the people struggled for this. It took 10 years to get this. Today, they're dedicated, they're super organized. They don't try to sell. They're organized and they take part in the monthly assemblies. You want some? It's not too sweet. No, thanks, really, but I never do coffee. The day I got the keys, I couldn't go in. I took the keys and I left. I couldn't bring myself to go in. I was trembling. I felt so emotional. You can't imagine when something is that important. It was worth fighting for in the rain and the sun and the heat. We arrived soaked to the skins, but it was good. The program My House, My Life began in 2009, not long after the 2008 economic crisis in the United States. At that time, there was a risk of several construction companies going bankrupt. So the My House, My Life program was designed primarily to give money to builders. The first aim was not to build social housing. That is a myth. Today, 98% of the program's budget is destined for companies, according to the constructor's terms and conditions. And they build apartments in remote areas of very poor quality. Only 2% of the My House, My Life program is organized by social movements. Only 2%, and they're the biggest and the best apartments. A strategist of despair, Guillermo Boulos is feared by the powerful. And his impartiality is the admiration of all those who want things to change. There are 28 occupations of homeless workers' movements in Sao Paulo. From 2008 until last year, the price of real estate in Sao Paulo rose on average by 215%. People don't have any money to pay rents, and they have no place to live. There aren't any political policies to help them. They sign up on lists, then they wait from 10 to 20 years. What are these people to do, disappear? No, they're going to create camps. We have a new mayor now in Sao Paulo. When he was elected, he said, I'm going to send a message to the homeless movement. Under my management, there will be no more illegal occupations. That's over. As if we needed the mayor's permission to occupy. There will be no more camps. That's a good one. Housing shortages, unemployment. I'd like to see if there will be no more occupations. Of course there will be. There will be lots of occupations, and we're going to make lots more. It's ridiculous. The situation is explosive. There are other areas where people are not giving up in Brazil. At the end of 2016, a wave of occupations submerged junior highs, high schools, universities. The young people just took the keys and built the schools they needed. For them, it was easy to do better. Education has always been terrible in Brazil. 
and children attending the rare good schools like this one in Rio have actually joined the movement as well. It's not pure chance that they're occupied because this has a lot to do with the quality of teaching. The students are protesting about everything that's happening in Brazil. The freeze on public spending that will reduce education budgets, Temer's illegitimate government, the expropriations. There are a lot of issues that have convinced the students to occupy several schools. How are you, Luisa? Thanks for talking to us. Luisa is 15 and a symbol of the young peril, but a symbol also of a Brazil that's breathing oxygen back into democracy. Here, we're divided into sectors. This is the communication sector that talks with the press, disgusted parents, cops who come in. We have food, some do the cooking, and there's the cleaning, but in fact everybody helps with that. Everything is organized. Everyone has something to do, and I'm proud of that. It's great to see people cleaning toilets. All the occupied schools I've seen are better now than before the occupation. Exactly. The committees for occupation also organize courses, with the teachers who support the movement, of course. And inviting a star like Gregorio is part of the new school plan. School must be a place for debate and discussion. Gregorio, you have no idea how frightened I am about the 2018 elections. I see the rise of these fascists. They arrive and they win. One morning, you wake up and someone says to you, shit, we have a fascist for president. Speaking, discussing, debating, that's what the president advised. Easy enough with young high school students, but with enlightened religious fanatics, nostalgic for military dictatorship, that's another matter. It's impossible to talk to them, and at the same time, we have to talk to them, because you can't despise one part of the population. You can't say, I don't want to discuss things with you, you're a fascist, shut up, beat it, go away. To them, you wouldn't say go to Cuba, of course, but go to, go to, where do they go? I don't know, Miami. Now, how do you talk to someone that thinks the dictatorship was awesome and that we need it back? For me, the real problem today is how to talk to them. I don't have an answer to that. If someone has one, let me know. A great day for high school students. They're in a little piece of Brazil that no longer wants to be exploited. This Brazil that doesn't want to be exploited has also taken to the streets. When more and more suspicions of corruption erupt about the new president, when six of his ministers have already resigned, and when Lula is still in the judge's sights, Guillermo Bulos turns revolt and disgust into energy. The homeless and the landless, angry artists, threatened Indians, trade unionists and those disappointed by petisme have grouped together under a common banner that Bulos has suggested, Povo Semedo, people without fear. They voice their anger together when, for example, MPs, among whom some from the PT, try to vote a law absolving the corrupted elect. We refuse the attempts on the part of Congress of some of the MPs to pass measures just to save their skins. They are also saying that everything has to go back to scratch. Like Gregorio, they don't want the political chaos to produce a religious fanatic or a populist billionaire who would reap all the benefits. For all of these people, Brazil is not dead because they still believe in it. <laughs>